So if I have a tibia that's going going ER and a femur that's going IR, you've got a patella that's going to get pulled laterally. Good morning. Happy Monday. I have NeuroCoffee in hand and it is perfect. All right. Digging into a new week. Uh, quick uh, note of housekeeping. Uh, IFASU members, the Q&A from last week is posted and ready for your viewing pleasure. So uh, take advantage of that. Digging into today's Q&A. Uh, this is with Cade. Cade is working with a uh, very high level basketball player um, that has a history of some tendon related issues in the knee, had a little bit of recurrence of knee pain. He's managing it actually quite well but we did talk about probably what you're going to find most often in these situations is you're going to have a mechanical issue with the knee. One of the most common findings you're going to have is you're going to see this tibiofemoral ER represented at the knee. Um, one of the easiest ways to, to check this is via your, your heel to butt knee flexion measure. So when you have a limitation in knee flexion, we oftentimes have that mechanical issue where you have tibiofemoral ER which would be promoting the screw home representation, which would be an extended representation of the knee and therefore knee flexion becomes limited. So using that as a test may be helpful for you. But we discuss a number of things um, in regards to the mechanical orientation, um, how to address some of the, the tendinopathy related uh, symptoms as far as loading the tendon, how we're gonna go about that. So again, probably gonna be useful for a lot of people. So thank you, Cade. If you'd like to participate in a 15 minute consultation, please go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com. Put 15 minute consultation in the subject line so I don't delete it. We will arrange that at our mutual convenience. Everyone have an outstanding Monday and I will see you later. All right, camera is on, clock is running. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Bill, so my main question is regarding an athlete that I had that plays basketball. Um, mm -hmm. He's been playing basketball for quite a while. Definitely yep. has some changes to tendons, um, particularly at his knees. Right. He has some, some different movement characteristics that I want to take into consideration. And so the main question is, knowing what I know about the way that he moves, what can I do to make sure that we're loading right and left knees appropriately from a, from a tendon health standpoint? Well, um, good luck with appropriate, right? When, when you're talking about high performers. For sure. So they're, they're always going to use compensatory strategies because they have to produce high levels of force very frequently and, and much higher levels of force than the average person. So you can't treat them like average ever. So, and I, I think you've had experience with this person over time. Am I correct? Like you, you right. okay. Yep. That's the best way to determine what the best course of action is, is to collect the data over time as you intervene and then, and then see what happens. And it's, it's my understanding that you, you were doing really, really well. And then you had a recurrence. Is that, is that correct? It, very, very mild. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call it a recurrence, but it was a signal like, Hey, it's something's going on. Okay. Let's, let's talk. Right. We also had a, a UTC scan done. Yeah. So. Um, and, and those are, those are handy. Um, but, but again, there's certainly not a measurement of symptoms, right? Yep. For sure. So, so we always have to take that into consideration as well. So, so let's think about what, what you've got going on here. You've got a guy that's got to produce a lot of force. So he's going to live near or in IR all the time. Yes. Okay. The question mark is, is how does he produce that? Chances are, um, again, the higher force production, the, the less relative motion you're actually going to, to utilize. And, and so that would be normal under his circumstances. So you should expect to see anti-orientation of the pelvis. You should expect to see um, changes at the uh, ankle and foot, right? You should expect to see um, concentric orientation of musculature that produces internal rotation, especially at the knee, right? So vastus lateralis is going to be concentrically oriented. Um, short head of biceps is going to be concentrically oriented, right? What you want to make sure though, is that you've got enough. And again, enough is the question mark when you're, when you're looking at performance, that you've got enough of the ER to capture positions and enough of the IR to produce force. And then that, that becomes the question mark. So when you start looking at the knee itself, 
How close to a heel to butt measurement do you have? So that's gonna give you an idea of how much tibia femoral IR you have. So you have normal knee bending. So if you have a situation where say you have a femur that is internally rotating to produce force into the ground and you've got a, a tibia that is remaining in external rotation, you have a mechanical disconnect, so to speak, as far as where you want those knee mechanics to be to produce force. Right. So if I have a tibia that's going, going ER and a femur that's going IR, you've got a patella that's going to get pulled laterally, which it loves to do because that's where it came from. So, so you have those circumstances, you have a mechanical circumstance that can produce um, aberrant mechanics, if you will, um, during force production. Whether it becomes symptomatic or not, that is duration of symptoms. How severe is the, is the, you know, the pressures and tensions that are related and then what is the perception? Right. Um, so again, those are all, all in play, but from a mechanical standpoint, you wanna make sure that you've captured enough enough of that of the tibial femoral ir so that when it does come time for him to put force into the ground he's doing it with um i don't want to say balance of forces because balance is variable but sufficient downward force through the joint versus say a situation where you've got more load on the medial aspect of the femur and you've got again the the concentric orientation of say vastus lateralis that's pulling patella off center mm -hmm. okay where again, you're going to have a, a situation where you're going to increase the compressive strategy of the patella against the femur. Under normal circumstances, there is a higher pressure of the patella against the femur. The question mark is, is, is it distributed enough that, it, that that's no longer symptomatic? So if you look at the patellofemoral pain research, and they always talk about how, oh, the pressure of the patella increases as you go into a deep squat. It's like, well, yeah, it's supposed to, but it's usually very well distributed. But right. if you have a situation where, where you've got this rotation across the knee, now you have a focal load, okay? That number one, so think about this, you squeeze the blood out of a patella, it hurts, all right? You get, a, you get an ischemic response in the patella itself. So people come in, they say, oh, my knee feels cold, or they feel like, like again, the, the, the focal loading strategy. If you've got a, any imaging, you'll see, you know, histories where the cartilage will start to thin, you know, in certain, certain areas on the, on the posterior patella. But the, the thing that I would encourage you to do is to try to give him enough relative motion so he can capture these, these positions and, and learn how to distribute load versus making them focal with the understanding that, it's probably not going to be a normal situation, mm -hmm. right? And again, when you're working with superheroes, it's not normal, right? You don't want normal because normal, <laughs> normal people don't run fast and jump high, right? And, and so, so you, you get to know this person over time by collecting data, you intervene to the best of your abilities, and then you monitor these things. But I would say that the, Typically, um, you're looking at at some mechanical issues um, that that may predispose some of this load to become more focal. Mm -hmm. And if you can distribute those, then that's great. So, um, you, you sent me some pictures of the uh, hip internal rotation measures. Yeah. So, so be aware as to where those measurements are taking place. Okay. So, if you do a prone hip internal rotation measurement what is the position of the hip under those circumstances? So if you've got a, a pelvis that is anteriorly oriented on the table, I can guarantee you that you've got an orientation into ER as you're taking that measurement. So, so um, it would be much like watching someone squat and having to move their, their knees apart and toe out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're capturing a position of ER space so they can move into that and then they produce IR from there. So if you're measuring under, under a similar circumstance, take that into consideration as to where you are capturing that yeah. IR measure. Because it, if it's not in line with the axial skeleton as, as would be a standard measure, then you need to be as consistent as possible with how you're measuring so you know when you're making a favorable or an unfavorable change. For sure. And, and I can definitely say that when we put him on his back and measure on the right side, there's a, a lot of side bends. A lot of it comes from his trunk. Right. Um, his knee is most certainly stuck in extension on that side. 
Mm-hmm. So he's got a, a twist. He's got an IRing and then an ERing of the lower leg. Yeah. And that's the side that I think is probably more likely to to become symptomatic over time because that it's just based off the way that he moves and some of the other stuff that he has going on he has changes to his achilles very mild plantaris compression on the medial side and then also like his big toes so you have a plantaris compression uh, according to the utc okay now hang on hang on this is this is useful this is useful so so think about think about what the knee would have to look like to get a plantaris compression right yeah. So, so you've got a, you've got a fluid shift that is posterior. Yeah, so a post, did, like a posterior did. lateral fluid shift. Am I correct? Yeah. He had like a little pouch on the front of his knee that we were able to, it was like a, it, it almost looked like his knee was swollen. Yeah. So that gets confused but, a lot because it's just the orientation of the knee. Out some, mm-hmm. it, was, it was, it was weird. I don't think it was synovial fluid. Yes, so like, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So like I said, this gets confused with swelling on, in a lot of cases because what you have is the femoral orientation resting on top of the, the tibial plateau. And so it creates, literally creates a shift in the fluid compartment itself. And so you get like this sort of like anterior aspect of, of the knee that will show a little bit of puffiness. And then you get the posterior aspect that looks looks swollen, right? right? Again, it gets misidentified. Um, a lot of times uh, the, the uh, uh, athlete will complain of like a posterior pressure um, yeah. at, at end range knee flexion Yep. And, and a lot of times it, it's literally just the fact that they can't create the, they can't reorient the knee to move the fluid out of that area. And so you're just compressing on an incompressible fluid. And that's so then that's what they're end up feeling. Yeah. His, his knee flexion, like healed, but improved tremendously once that started to move back in the correct direction. Um, I, yeah. I guess like a, a quick follow-up, uh, cause I know you had talked previously about loading Achilles differences, uh-huh. like a, a posterior calf that's compressed, put them in a seated position, like a seated calf raise, make sure they're yeah. in position. Yeah. Let's let's just, I guess, as an exercise, if we're checking all those boxes from a movement standpoint, like you just discussed, and we do want to do some direct loading of those tendons. Yep. Like if you look at the research, most of the research is going to suggest that you put it in the most lengthened position possible. So like old school knee extension, put it all the way at the bottom and yep. then Gently apply pressure and hold for an isometric and so on. Yes, sir. Do I need to? T- Sorry. That type of thing. No problem. In, in consideration uh, when loading, him, is it going to be the same thing? Is it going to going to be creating a situation that I don't want if I do that on both sides? Did I have one side that's more like a uh, like a, like, an, like an EQI like a isometric, almost in the extension? Would that be a better fit for one side or the other? I'm just trying to figure out the best way to load. You're talking about loading the Achilles, though, right? Uh, right now, patella, patella. Oh, you, oh, so we're talking about a squat or we're talking about just, just anything like, yeah, I mean, any position I'm not married to anything, but I guess my question is like you, like you had mentioned, there's kind of like a best way to load, like, okay, you've got this posterior compression in a right calf, like he does. Right. A straight leg, like standing, like loading his Achilles in that position might not be the best. Okay. Yeah. Seen. Well, okay. So, so again, you, you got some mechanics to deal with here as to as to how you're going to load the achilles so obviously loading it in a bent knee versus a straight knee orientation is not going to be the same is that is that kind of what we're getting at for sure and is that situation applicable also to the knee i guess is like can you like customize the loading um versus getting compressed yeah probably to a probably to a little bit lesser lesser degree of concern You're, you're when you're loading the knee it's going to have to be in a bent position right? To get any measure of, of yield, For right? Sure. So again, so you're looking at probably some form of, of a, a squat, which would be very difficult to hold, hold under sufficient load, yeah. or you go old school and you go with like a, like a seated knee extension, which is, again, the tendon doesn't know how you're getting the load onto it. It just knows that it's being loaded, right? And so again, f- trying to find a way uh, to get that load, because again, if you're trying to load a, a knee with the sufficient load, based on the research, the, the the magnitude of load that is required to influence t- tendinous change is pretty freaking high, right? Yeah, and it's, it's like imagine trying to hold that position with that that degree of yeah, not going to happen. So again, if you can find a better way to do that, um, you know, and again, this is where you know 
people want to poo-poo machine-based training. It's like these are these become useful under those circumstances because I can use higher levels of load um, and, and maintain um, those those positions that I do need um, to influence the tendon. Because it's a it's a lot of time, it's a lot of time in those positions. It's not just yes. you know what we would typically use for, for strength training because you have to get the stress relaxation response, which is a duration-based adaptation. Yeah, I, I feel like the machine-based approach in that regard, I think we found more success with um, because we're getting the changes with, or working towards the outcomes that we're going for without layering on this excessive fatigue. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Same as like, we really haven't even done much like leg pressing. It's just been more on the, because we're, we're, we're training, we're doing things outside of just this like loading of the tendon. Right. There's right. Got a lot of other stuff going on. So I'm, I'm just trying to like hedge my bets what's, what's kind of the, the middle ground here that we can still get some load through the, the yeah. tissue like you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, not, yeah. Not put any excessive fatigue on them. That's right. Important. And I, I, you know, the, the, the thing that w while we, we can rely on some of the, the research as far as the response of the tendon to loading and such, I still think that the mechanical component becomes the, the exactly. primary concern under all circumstance. I, I am 100%. Boat. Yeah, we want normal behaviors available to us. Yes. You know, you think about just just the fluid content alone under these circumstances. Too much ten too much tension, not enough fluid in the in the tendon itself so it can can have normal behaviors. And it's like, okay, well how do I do that? Is that going to be a load-based response? Probably not. That's going to be the the ability to to move the the connective tissue through its full excursion of compression and expansion just like everything else. That makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. That's great. Thank you, Bill. I'll definitely take that stuff into consideration. And, um, you know, I, I think definitely feel much more comfortable about the direction we're heading in, just making sure that we're doing things the right way. Yeah. And, and again, use your data over time. Trust it. Trust yep. your data over time. Small, measurable changes consistently. Don't go for home runs. That, that's all we're going for. No home runs. There you go. All awesome. All right, Kate. You got have a great day. Thank you, Bill. You too. Bye-bye. Right, Bye-bye.